The number of states with a populist leader today is almost five times higher than at the end of the Cold War. The global trend of political polarization affects not just our national democracies, but also how states interact and whether they are able to address common problems. So we definitely need to talk about populism and how it affects world politics. My name is Kilian Spandler. I'm a researcher at the School of Global Studies at the University of Gothenburg. And one of my main research interests is populism and how it affects global cooperation. And that has become an increasingly important question over the last couple of years, uh, as populism has really seen a huge success in various countries around the globe. So if you look at Europe, you can think of the huge electoral success of parties like the Sweden Democrats, like the Rassemblement National in France, like the Lega Nord in Italy, the Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, and the list goes on and on. Uh, but really all around the globe, populists have risen to power, um, like in India with Narendra Modi, like Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, and of course we all still remember Donald Trump in the US. So the question really becomes, how does this global rise of populism affect how states cooperate, how they pursue their foreign policies? And that's a hugely important question because many would argue that uh, a lot of the global problems that we face today, uh, like cybersecurity, like uh, the management of communicable diseases and climate change, demand cooperation across national boundaries. But populism is often associated with nationalism, with inward-looking policies. So we really need to investigate this trend and how populist leaders conduct foreign policy. And that's something that I have done in my research. But before we get into the findings of that research, just a quick explainer of what populism actually is. Um, I already mentioned that populism is often associated with nationalism, but it actually helps to keep the two distinct. So while nationalism is sort of a very broad ideology that values the nation and that sees the state as the protector of the nation and the state should advance the interests of that nation, populism is really a very malleable um, kind of thin ideology that can be hooked up to different sorts of ideologies, including but not limited to nationalism. Right? So what really lies at the core of this populist logic is the opposition between the people on the one hand and the elites on the other. So what populist leaders do is that they construct and promote this idea of a people and juxtapose it uh, against the elites who are portrayed as corrupt and as disenfranchising the common man, the ordinary man. Um, and as acting against the interest of the people, the popular will. So how does this logic of populist politics translate into strategies on the international level? Well, researchers have actually found a pretty ambivalent picture. So yes, on the one hand, populists adopt often nationalist ideologies and they often critique and undermine international organizations. Just think of Donald Trump and his attacks on the World Health Organization during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but at the same time, you also see that many populists still maintain um, ties within international organizations. Even the Trump administration has not outrightly rejected any kind of cooperation. It remains engaged in international organizations. And there are even some populist leaders who create new international organizations who see themselves as champions of multilateralism. So it's a really, really um, intriguing, but also a strange picture that we see. And our research has tried to disentangle these ambivalences and to really address this puzzle of cooperation on the one hand and nationalism on the other. 
So what my colleagues and I have done in our research is to look at three populist leaders. We have looked at Viktor Orban in Hungary. We have looked at the late Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez, and Rodrigo Duterte, president of the Philippines. And we have um, read their speeches and analyzed them to see if we can find common themes in how they talk about international cooperation. And what we did find is that, yes, even though they are ideologically different, um, ranging from the left wing Hugo Chavez to the right wing Viktor Orban, they do employ a kind of common language, what we could call a common script of international cooperation. And that was very interesting for us to see. So how does this script shape the cooperation strategies of uh, populist leaders? Well, we found that populist leaders choose to cooperate for two main reasons. One is that cooperation allows them to portray themselves as leaders who take back control uh, from foreign elites or from corrupt elites and give it back to the people. So often uh, populists talk about uh, international politics in terms of popular sovereignty. That's a bit different from national sovereignty or state sovereignty in that it displays the people as the main uh, group who should have control over international affairs. And they would argue that many of today's international organizations actually disempower the people. But at the same time, sometimes international cooperation can be a way of dealing with those elites and of taking back decision-making power and putting it back where it belongs, namely with uh, the people. So if we look at Hugo Chavez, his regional cooperation strategies in Latin America were very clearly oriented against um, the US-led international organizations, which um, pro promoted a kind of neoliberal agenda, which he rejected. So the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. For him, regional cooperation among Latin American states was a way to take back control and give it back to uh, the population in those states. The second reason why populists would sometimes choose to cooperate across boundaries is to protect the identity of the people against internal or external threats. And a prime example of that would be Viktor Orban's push for tougher policies in the EU on migration, on asylum policies and on border controls, because that's something that he can sell domestically as an effort to protect Hungary, but more, more specifically the Hungarian people and their common Christian heritage against uh, a, a threat from outside. Okay, so we see that populists do have good reasons to cooperate uh, across national boundaries. But at the same time, we also found that this cooperation has clear limits. So for one, populists tend to cooperate in very specific forms, and they are really clear about not wanting to cede too much control and decision-making powers to international organizations. So of course, many of today's international organizations like the European Union have their own independent uh, decision-making powers and also ways of enforcing their decisions. And that's something that uh, very clearly goes against the idea of popular sovereignty in populist uh, political discourses. So that's one of the reasons why Viktor Orban um, argues so strongly for reform of the European Union as a way of giving back more decision-making power to the individual member states. Another limitation is that populists tend to cooperate only on those issues that are strategically advantageous to them because they can sell them uh, domestically to their voters as a success in taking back control and in advancing the interest and the will of the people. So, for example, uh, Rodrigo Duterte has uh, pushed for cooperation on organized crime in Southeast Asia because he has this domestic agenda of the so-called war on terror, 
right? And what we see, unfortunately, is that many of those issues, uh, like also the, um, the sort of the crusade against refugees by Viktor Orban, um, goes, um, is done on the backs of already vulnerable groups. And the third limitation is that populists generally favor symbolic cooperation. So they very much like cooperation that allows them to portray themselves as strong men, that has a very dramaturgical element, uh, you know, grandiose speeches, uh, ritualistic kinds of uh, displays of power, um, photo ops, etc. And that is, of course, also a bit problematic because it doesn't always mean that the actual problems get tackled in the end. So summing up, the overall picture that we get is that populism does not prevent international cooperation, but it very much changes its shape and its goals. Now, with Brexit done and with Trump out of the office, it may seem like the big wave of populism has reached its peak. And indeed, many researchers would argue that the fate of individual populist leaders is often very short-lived. But even as politicians come and go, the underlying social conditions that give rise to populist sentiment very much remain. So it's definitely an issue that we will be dealing with in the future and that will also raise challenges for non-populist forces in our societies, because they will have to ask themselves, do we see populist governments as viable partners to address important global issues like climate change? Or would that actually fundamentally compromise our ideas of international cooperation and our democratic values? So these are tough questions, and we as researchers will be watching them closely in the future.